Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The first step in the preparation of a three-quarter crown for the bicuspid is the establishment of the finishing line and path of draw. A Bowley gauge is used to place a distal pencil line parallel with a mesial groove on the molar. These pencil marks are the eventual position of the tracer cuts and both lines should be parallel with the grooves on the molar preparation. A lightening strip is used to open the contact on the mesial of the bicuspid in order to allow sufficient space for a matrix band. The matrix band is placed on the first bicuspid to act as a guide in the protection of the distal surface during the preparation phase. The mesial is sliced utilizing a long tapered diamond from the seven o'clock position. The diamond is very carefully passed through the mesial surface, taking care not to cut the adjacent band or tooth. It is brought just through the contact area, taking care not to over taper or make this area of slice too open. You'll note from the occlusal view, the amount of opening that we have obtained with this diamond. Next, tracer cuts are made with a bullet-shaped diamond. The first one is placed on the lingual surface and the diamond is buried to one half its diameter. The next tracer cut is made on the distal of the bicuspid and it is cut from the 11 o'clock position with the patient turned slightly. Using the same diamond, the lingual and distal surfaces are reduced to the depth of the tracer cuts. When the distal slice has been completed using the peripheral pencil marks of the preparation as a guide, the lingual surface is reduced, taking care to go no deeper than the tracer cuts. Keeping the cuts as parallel with the long axis of the tooth as possible. You'll note that the tip of the diamond touches the pencil line outlining the cervical finishing line. As we approach the mesial of the tooth, care must be taken not to cut the adjacent tooth. This diamond is slightly wider than the diamond used for slicing. The next step is to place the distal box on the bicuspid using the mesial box on the molar as a guide in parallelism. The distal box is prepared with a 170 carbide burr. The mesial box is placed parallel to the distal box of the bicuspid and the mesial box of the molar, taking care not to extend it too far to the buccal surface. You'll note that the carbide burr is pendulated in order to give adequate width to the box. When the boxes are completed, the isthmus is prepared. The boxes are further refined using hand instruments to remove any unsupported enamel and to give detail to mesial and distal boxes. The occlusal surface is then reduced utilizing occlusal tracer cuts. The tracer cuts are made to the full diameter of the diamond instrument. Once the tracer cuts have been placed, the occlusal surface is reduced to the depth of the tracer cuts following the original occlusal outline of the occlusal surface. 
you'll note that the tip of this diamond is tapered, and the diamond will have to be buried a bit further in order to get an adequate depth. The occlusion is then checked from the seven o'clock position. A pencil line is placed showing the buccal occlusal extension of the finishing line. The same diamond is then used to reduce this occlusal surface. The occlusal surfaces will ultimately then be protected against the forces of the opposing cusps. The occlusal reduction is checked with three thicknesses of 28 gauge green wax. And it's observed if it has equal density. If there are modifications, they can be done at this time. The preparation is finished with a fine grit diamond and will remove the roughness of the original cutting diamond. The line angles are rounded and polished. A medium sand disc then is used to remove any roughness in the preparation, taking care not to obliterate the finish lines that have been established with the finishing diamond. The sand disc is turned around on the mandrel and the mesial surface is carefully polished. You'll note that there are smooth surfaces. The finishing line is sharp, and there are sharp definite boxes on the mesial and distal with the isthmus connecting the boxes. The line angles have been rounded. There is adequate protection of the occlusal surface. You'll note that the mesial surface has been opened so that casting can be placed and an impression can be readily taken in this particular area and the buckle cusp has been adequately protected. The prepared crown then is temporized by placing an ion crown on the bicuspid preparation. The cervical limits of the preparation are traced on the crown with an explorer. The buckle cutout is marked on the buckle surface and a crown and bridge collar scissors is used to trim the margins to the explorer mark. The trimmed crown is tried back on the tooth. The cervical limits of the crown then are re-evaluated for any changes in the cervical contour and length. A crown and bridge contour pliers can be used to burnish the cervical margin. A green stone is used to remove any roughness on the cervical margin. And a rubber cratex or sulci is used to obtain a smooth polish. The crown is tried back on the tooth to assure that there is an adequate fit. The occlusion is checked at this time. Vaseline is used to lubricate the plastic model tooth. 
A zinc oxide eugenol cement is used to cement the crown in place. The cervical margins are lightly burnished with a tarno cementing instrument. After it is sufficiently hardened, the excess temporary cement is removed. The cervical margins are again checked with an explorer. And before the patient is dismissed, the occlusion is rechecked with articulating paper. You'll note that the finished temporary crowns are properly contoured and fit harmoniously with the natural teeth. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.